People don't realize the role that a stunt team plays on a movie. On the Avatar sequels, we rely on them to not do stunts that stand out as spectacular. We ask them to do stunts that play as part of our story's narrative. Dad! Let's get it done. Jim, of course, doesn't like things to just be animated. You're gonna do them for real. The only thing we're not real is us being blue. <gasps> I've got a dry team and I've got a wet team. So some of the things that we're doing are gonna be 30 feet in the air, and we'll let the actors do it full on, and we'll catch their movement, their acting and everything, and then we'll build it up, and we'll let those seasoned professionals, those parkour professionals, do that same motion. Who do all the slinging, climbing, falling, grappling, the action through the air. <laughs> those guys. For the James Cameron film, the action fuels the story, while the story also fuels the action, and it makes it so dynamic, and it makes it so engaging that it makes you want to know what happens next. Fighting, falling, parkouring. We have the best in the world for each individual piece. <laughs> Flying at Gron is much more difficult than it ever was before. Jim wanted people jumping on, jumping off, <laughs> flying around. He even wanted that bird to fly on the stage and be able to come to a landing. We have multiple riggers and stunt performers operating the bird, helping it turn left, right, circling, flying, diving. So we have to have our performers in sync with the creature. <laughs> The wet team, you know, their breath holds are amazing. One of my top guys, his breath hold is like 11 minutes down there, which is ridiculous. A lot of the people that came from Cirque du Soleil, synchronized swimmers, Olympic hopefuls, so they can move like you've never seen before in that water. Dudes have been falling off horses the same way since Truman was president. You know, when I first was approached by Garrett, and he's like, we've got to invent some stuff, and it's probably not possible, but if anybody can figure it out, James Cameron thinks I can, so let's do it. For the water sequences in this movie, we had to figure out how to make some of these creatures fly underwater. And how are we going to do it? Are we going to use this thing called a jetivator and use underwater jets to help make it work? And there goes your hand, you know, like it's so fast. We got to be the first people to actually ever take it underwater. I kept getting ripped off. And Garrett's like, dude, can you stay on that thing? I'm like, yeah, I'm trying. And you're Fighting underwater, what it reminds me of is if we were in the gym and we were hitting a heavy bag, and you're hitting that heavy bag as fast as you can, as many times as you can, and as hard as you can while holding your breath, see how long you last. That's probably what your limit's gonna be underwater. The final battle is amazing. It's epic. At one point, Corridge and Jake have this huge knife fight while this ship is capsizing, turning, listing, and falling over on itself. We had to build this huge truss-enabled skeleton of the ship, and we had to drive it with these computerized winches so that it was able to turn at the right time, at the right speed. And this is one of the processes that makes this film feel so real, is that it was real. Now we're underwater, we're really fighting underwater. And so that's part of the process of making it real. One of the things I love about working with Jim is that he will create that environment for you. If we need real fire, there's gonna be real fire in that stage. If we need those physical things in our hands to interact with, to make it real, it will be there. This movie is not just some amazing trip into another world. It's also still a reality-based movie that's right here in your face, and that's why I love it.